Bodyguard is a riveting, high-intensity political thriller set against a backdrop of a sergeant and war vet who was assigned to protect a high-profile politician against potential terror threats. I'm Rob LaCuria, Senior Editor at Gold Derby, here with Jed Mercurio, creator and writer of the show that has quickly become a massive hit across the whole planet. Um, Jed, I don't recall the last time uh, that a show gave you severe anxiety like this one did. So I just was wondering whether you were aware of how much anxiety you've caused for fans and critics, and, and do you often hear from people how excited and riveted they were by the show? Uh, we're thrilled when we get that feedback, you know, to hear that people say things like, I, I forgot to breathe, I just couldn't <laughs> move from my TV. Um, normally when I watch TV, I'm kind of in and out the room, I'm looking at my phone, but I just couldn't take my eyes off this show. That's so uh, thrilling and we feel so fortunate and privileged to have that response. I mean, obviously word of mouth has helped the show because it was a massive ratings hit for the BBC last year. In fact, two of your shows are like the biggest hits of the year. I mean, because even Line of Duty's done extraordinarily well um, on telly. So, and it's also been a huge hit on Netflix. That's how I've seen it. And a lot of people across the, um, the world have seen it through Netflix. Do you think that it's, um, like, do you think that this show is better binged or is it better to be watched, you know, week to week? That's a really good question. And what we uh, are kind of hearing from the, the worldwide audience is that both are okay. Um, I, over here in, in the UK, viewers didn't have a choice initially, but um, it is available to stream. So some people have been choosing to, to watch it that way. And obviously we all know how Netflix viewers are able to, to choose how, how, when and how much they watch. Um, I, I think that what we found over here was that it, it really fueled the word of mouth that because there was a week between each episodes and it, uh, each episode and it went out in a prime time slot social media allows a lot of conversation around the talking points of the show uh, and and maybe that's something you miss out on if you binge watch yeah and like you know if you if you go into it without much a pre knowledge like i did you just think oh well this looks interesting i'll give it a shot and i i think i watched it in one sitting with my wife and it was like it was, as I said, severe anxiety, and you know that's 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 actually quite cool, as you say. It's nice to hear that people are invested. Um, I want to go back to the first episode. So we first encountered David on a train, um, where things go really pear shaped quite quickly as he storms to action to defuse a terror terrorist bomb threat, and um, the, it, it's propulsive from the moment we start. Um, so talk me through uh, why you decided to, sh to start the show in that way. It was designed to dramatize the character's backstory in, in the most dynamic way by making his, his relevant backstory come out in the present uh, in, in a high stakes, high jeopardy scenario. So what we find out about the character over the course of those 20 minutes in, in a very focused and intense sequence are all the relevant points that he's, he's a father of, of young children, but the the mother is absent at that point, that um, he's a police officer, uh, that he's a, a can-do brave guy, but then we find out that he's got his own issues, that, that he served in the Middle East and he has empathy for victims of the conflict over there and has a real uh, antagonism towards the politicians who ordered those campaigns. So all of that information comes out over the course of that, that time. And it leads us to believe that possibly this is a kind of maverick, impulsive, maybe even unstable guy. Yeah. And I mean, that's the, that's the, the beauty of his character and how he's got to toe this very fine line between uh, people that he feels some empathy for, but is also having to protect someone that he really doesn't agree with at all. Um, and that, that was a really important part of his character, wasn't it? It's, it's essential to the, the identity of the series. When we were originally conceiving Bodyguard, we arrived fairly quickly at the idea that we would meld the political thriller with the, the cop show. And we have the advantage over here in the UK that senior politicians are protected by police officers. There isn't a, a special unit like, say, the US Secret Service that, it, that is tasked to do that. So we were allowed to tell the story 
from the viewpoint of the institution of the police and a particular police officer. Um, but what really um, created the, the, the uh, singular identity of the series was that um, he could be the hero and the villain encapsulated in, in one character. He's not uh, a square-jawed hero who's going to protect the politician at all costs and, and then we would follow a kind of cat and mouse thriller. It's much more that he is uh, an impulsive, unstable, traumatized individual and he, and he actually fits the profile of the kind of person who might be the biggest threat to the politician. Yeah, and that, I mean, actually that was my favorite aspect of the show because I never quite knew who was good, who was bad, who do I trust, who, do, who am I rooting for? Um, and then, you know, obviously the leading man at, at one point towards the middle of the show even looked like he was probably really dirty and I thought, oh, I've, I've solved it. I know what's going to happen. And then obviously I was completely wrong and uh, you, you kept kind of um, pulling the rug from under us. And, and is that a lot of fun to play with the audience's allegiances? Yeah, I think that's a big part of how the show works, that um, across each episode we, we try and swing the pendulum in one definite direction so that by the time you finish the hour of viewing, you have a different view of the, the, the character and of the show and of the main plot points that you had at the beginning of the hour. And we kind of play, play that card um, in every episode. It, it feels like we want to create the biggest possible swing in, in sympathy and allegiance uh, as we go through the show. But what you're also doing um, is twisting and turning and doing things that are very unexpected. So Keely Hawes is, to, to, to my mind, she's going to be the main character of the show or at least a second fiddle to um, to Bud. And then she's one, there one minute and then she's gone. Um, completely unexpected. And, and and again, even the ending, which I don't want to spoil in case someone someone hasn't seen it yet, which is probably unlikely at this stage if they're watching this. But that ending completely got me as well because I thought, okay, I, I, I've... I think I know where he's going with this, and then it was a completely different ending. Um, how carefully do you have to map out a show like this to ensure that each reveal lands perfectly? I think the big decision in uh, mapping the architecture of the series was, was the midpoint, was the, um, the, the assassination. That that was the thing that, that not only was the big shock of the series because uh, things were, were set up in a certain way, that, that, that led you to believe that wasn't, wasn't going to happen. But then it, it changes the dynamic. And after that, the, um, the protagonist and the conspiracy have stopped being hypotheticals. They're, they're real things for us now to engage with. So we're, we're asking very concrete questions about whether he was complicit in the assassination and if he wasn't, who was, and, uh, and so forth. So it, it, it creates a an intrigue that wasn't there before. The show also has to walk a, quite a fine line between depicting um, the perpetrators of these terrorist threats as multidimensional while not, while not necessarily demonising them because a lot of shows in, in this particular genre are criticised for, de for demonising Muslims or people from the Islamic community. And I was wondering whether you were conscious of this and how you wanted to handle that. It was really important for us that in that first episode we portrayed the relationship between Western military operations in the Middle East and, and the rise of homegrown Islamist terrorism. So that's something that was encapsulated in the first scene, David Budd's sympathy towards the would-be suicide bomber because he understood that there was a, there was a sense of, of resentment that had been created by the, the, the Western powers. And that was something that was then repeated by his, his colleague, the, the veteran, uh, who ran a group where he was speaking on a political platform about the um, the way in which uh, radicalization uh, of Islamist terrorism was, was being fueled by certain actions of Western governments. So I think it was important to to draw that that particular uh, reference point. And and the other thing is that we we wanted to portray people within this world from. Um, uh, South Asian heritage who were on the other side of, of, of terrorism were, were working to stop terrorism and and again that was that that representation was important. Um, the show also delves quite deeply um, into how PTSD affects 
a man's life, a protecting this man at the centre of the story. Um, what were your priorities in um, trying to get that right? Yeah, we felt that, that PTSD was something that needed to be handled sensitively. And one of the decisions we made very early on was that it, it wasn't something which would vanish from the character. So sometimes in, in drama, you see these things handled in a superficial way where once a character has, has solved the case or, or got what he, he needs in the rest of his life, his, his mental health problem improves. And we wanted to show that, that it's much more complicated than that. And, and what was important for the character was to seek help. And, and so the, towards the end, the fact that he eventually stops hiding his problem and verbalizes it and seeks help was was pointing towards the fact that he was on a journey to recovery but that would be a long and complicated journey mm. let's drill, just drill down into uh, certain parts of this series we talked about the, the pilot which um initially is set on a moving train uh to me that made it even more exciting it was something a little different but just from reading your twitter feed the other day i noticed that that wasn't always the original plan was it that's right. The original plan was to shoot in Waterloo Station in London, and and the whole sequence had, had been meticulously planned. Uh, and then at the eleventh hour, uh, Waterloo Station told us that they didn't want us to come and film there. So that that was a real blow to us and created an enormous challenge for the production. Not not only did we lose a lot of filming time and a lot of uh, resources that had been invested in in that but we also then had to reconceive that sequence so we didn't shoot that sequence until the very end of the shoot um so the shoot had to be extended uh and we shot it on a a, a private railway uh, out in the countryside outside of london and um the results um are, are are really very pleasing you know once we 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 solved the the problems of shooting in that kind of environment we did end up with a, a really intense sequence that that did uh, propel the character and the story in the right way. Yeah, and then if you go straight to the finale, um, it features David with a bomb strapped to him for much of it. And uh, when I spoke to Richard a few months ago, uh, he agreed that it was a particularly challenging um, or series of scenes for him to shoot. In fact, I think he said it was probably one of the hardest things he did. Um, whilst on this particular project. What were your recollections of those days when shooting the sequences where he has the bomb strapped to him and he's trying to figure out a way to get out of it? Well, it, it was an amazing job by Richard because it was it was a bit of an ordeal. We, we were filming uh, in London. It was very cold at the time and, and uh, it, it was relentless. We were filming day after day. Uh, because it was it was such a long and intense sequence, and and Richard was was in pretty much every shot. So um, I was just so impressed by his dedication and and his stamina. And he just for for a number of days, long hard days, he just delivered a fantastic performance. Yeah, he absolutely did. Did you, if you have to choose a particular scene or sequence or something about this first season that you found absolutely the most challenging or it was just giving you the most grief, keeping up at night, what would you choose? I think it would be the opening sequence purely because there were so many variables that, that we had to, to pull together. And uh, as we found out with the Waterloo experience, you can't control everything. So uh, when we got to the end of the shoot and we knew that we'd um, got the, the whole show in the can, apart from the, the crucial first 20 minutes. So we kind of went there with a real sense of trepidation. We knew that in the week we were there that we really had to deliver on the opening. And there were a lot of quite uh, intense challenges to overcome just in terms of getting everything shot in the, in the time available to us. And so you're at the point now where the first season has aired. Um, it's been it's, it's aired a while ago now. Um, it's become a hit across the world. Um, you know, it's a re quite a big hit for Netflix um, internationally, and it's starting to win awards. It's received nominations in various by various groups. Probably most high profile in the states has been the Golden Globes, where you guys are nominated and Richard won. Um, take us back to that night. Oh, it was a, a fantastic night. We were thrilled to. Um be part of that with so many great shows and so many great talents and 
you know, personally to be in the room with, with so many legends of film and TV was uh, a really humbling and flattering experience. And uh, I've got great memories of the night. And also it was just so fantastic that, that Richard won. Um, it, it came as, I think, a real shock to him. I think that he knew how strong the category was. And he's, he's a very modest guy. And I, I think that the, the look on his face when, when his name was called really spoke volumes. Uh, and he really deserved it. Yeah, I, it was a really good moment. In fact, I, I, when I spoke to him offline, I said, mate, you're going to win that. And he was like, nah, you know, whatever. He was, he was being very humble. It was, it was a very good feeling to see him actually take the trophy home. So, yeah, I agree. Um, so season two, what can you tell us about season two? Have you started working on it? When can we expect it? What's going on? Um, we're in talks, so we're, we're still negotiating with, with, with all the various um, personnel and, and looking at, at when we can make it and in talks with uh, the, uh, the, the relevant broadcasters. So there's, there's no update as yet. It's quite, it's quite a complex um, production and, and there's a lot to discuss. Fair enough. Well, we just have to wait then and be patient. Um, Jed, again, thank you for the anxiety and thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Thank you. And to all Bodyguard fans, go to goldderby.com right now. Make your predictions so you can compete against our experts and editors. And don't forget to subscribe on the button below and watch all of our other videos with awards contenders. Thanks a lot.